here are some of the tips that, that I can sort of give you. And here are my disclosures. So as a broad overview, I'm going to talk about some of the, the tenets of MIS. Then I'm going to talk about preoperative planning, um, both for decompressions and for fusions as well. And then I'm going to talk about some intraoperative strategies that I, li I like to employ during these procedures, some of the postoperative um, protocols that we implement, and then finally a summary. So the, the tenets of MIS surgery really, I just want to let you know that MIS is hard. It's not meant to be easy. So like any other thing that you've ever done in your life that's, that's not easy, don't expect it to be easy. Just expect it that it's going to be very difficult in the beginning. But as you, get a, as you get used to it, it's going to get a little bit easier. But mastering MIS is even harder, OK? So um, all, all the faculty members will also let you know that it's a, it's a process of learning and, and always refining your technique and just getting a little bit better incrementally. You're not, you're not going to get better overnight. It's about the, the process of actually getting better. Be sure to take your time. There's, there's no rush. Just expect, I would add, if, if you don't do any MIS and you're trying to start learning some MIS, I would add, actually double your time estimate just to be safe. And then learn adequately to decompress first. And this is really important. Before you start putting in like pedicle screws, I know we're here to learn all these advanced techniques and all, but really, it's really about the decompression, especially when patients present with ridiculous complaints. And really keep, you guys have already done the first step, but keep on going to as many MIS courses as you possibly can, because by going to these types of courses, and I learn a ton, not only from my fellow faculty members, but by going to the cadaver labs, you can actually really practice the skill, and it does take a lot of time and energy. And you might have heard this, but it takes about 10,000 hours to achieve mastery in almost anything that we do. This was actually by Dr. Levitin, you know, but, um, but it's, it's from Malcolm Gladwell. He quotes Dr. Levitin in Outliers. And this is really true, you know, especially in, in surgery where it is a craft where you continuously have to hone the skill and the art of surgery. So what does MIS mean to surgeons, though? Before mastering MIS, there's a really steep learning curve. There's no question about that. It's going to be really hard. We mentioned that. Initially, you're going to have longer OR times. And you're going to see a drop in revenue. This is a reality of it. And a lot of surgeons don't like to talk about this, but this is really true. Initially, during that first learning curve, probably within the first year or two, your revenue will drop because of the fact that it's going to take you longer to do the same type of procedure. But after mastering, and I put that sort of in quotes, MIS, You'll have improved clinical outcomes, and you're going to have an enhanced marketing opportunity as well. So in a lot of these markets where MIS is not really prevalent, you're going to find out that people naturally, patients naturally know that they want to have the least invasive procedure, and your, the name, your name and your procedure will get around into the community. And ultimately, it's about the fact that you're going to have happier patients because of the fact that they're going to have superior clinical outcomes. So with respect to preoperative planning, you don't change your indications whatsoever, OK? At least initially. Like What I'm saying is that MIS should not expand your indications of being a more aggressive surgeon or anything like that. All it means is that for the same type of indications for pain, instability, neurologic deficit, progressive deformity, keep the indications the same. Start with one-level cases. Don't try to go out there and do like multi-level cases on a morbidly obese patient for your first case or your first few cases because it's going to be very painful for you. Um, start with thin patients. And I would, I would say that start with thin patients, especially for posterior. For laterals, it's a little bit different. But for posterior, start with thin patients. And you'll thank me later for that, I promise you. Um, and then really, when you start doing MIS, it also helps you to become, or it forces you to become a much more astute clinician because of the fact that before, you know, if you expose everything, you could just do a laminectomy and you could just treat everything, central stenosis, lateral recess stenosis, not really foraminal stenosis. But as an MIS surgeon, it forces you to pinpoint where that pathologic lesion is and it forces you to be able to go straight down into where that compressive lesion is. And again, plan to double your OR time. This is just a natural thing that, that is going to happen. This is an interesting um, study from the SAS Journal by Dr. Morenstern. And he took, the, took a look at the learning curve of, of a single spine surgeon who performed foraminal endoscopic discectomy in 144 consecutive patients. 
And the interesting thing about this study is that there was a definite learning curve in this. As you can see here, it, just for this, this pr procedure, one procedure, this foraminal endoscopic dis discectomy, it took him 72 cases, or about 50% of his pr procedures, of his series, before he got good or excellent results. Before, it was below good or excellent. So it just lets you know that it does take time and energy in order to actually get better at this. And then he also s saw this trend, is that initially your OR times are pretty long, but as you do more cases, the OR time decreases, and it should be at least equivalent to your previous open surgeries as well. This study was um, presented, it was, it was from my senior partner, uh, Reggie Knight, and myself, and we took a look at our first 30 patients treated with MIST lifts. We found a similar trend in that the first 15 cases, the blood loss was relatively higher, but as we got better at it, it, it dropped down, and we've seen that trend over time as well. It will plateau at some point, and with respect to the times, it was really long. It was hard at the very beginning, and then it goes back to sort of normal of what your time for open surgeries are. And I would advocate that if you become um, better at MIS, sometimes it can actually be faster than your open times as well. So let's talk about some intraoperative strategies. So what are the core skill sets required for MIS? MIS decompression is the number one, number one thing that you really should learn. MIS fusion should be the second thing that you should learn. And then MIS instrumentation is the last thing that you should learn. And you, again, you, with respect to instrumentation, you should start with one level, then two levels, and then so forth. Don't, don't try to do like a, a complex deformity right away. So with respect to MIS decompression, um, this is a, let me just sort of talk about one of my patients. She's a 46 year old pharmacist. So she's pretty um, well educated. And she said right off the bat, I do not want a fusion. That's what she said right off the bat. And then she presented with six months of prog progressively worsening left-sided leg pain. She had 90% left leg pain and only 10% low back pain. She'd failed all the conservative measures. And this is what her pain diagram looked like, you know? So clearly she has nothing marked in her low back. Everything is in her buttock, left buttock, and then left posterior thigh, left calf, and a very classic presentation, dermatomal di distribution. So this is what um, her, her x-rays look like. She has a grade one degenerative spondylolisthesis. And then on flexion ex extension, it moves a little bit, not much. So it's relatively stable, spondy. She has evidence of lateral recess stenosis as well as foraminal stenosis, in particular on her left symptomatic side. And this is what her axials look like. So she's got pretty significant stenosis. So, so her diagnosis is a grade one L45 degenerative spondylolisthesis with lateral recess and foraminal stenosis. And I would say that probably if you, if you polled 100 surgeons, I would bet that probably over half of them would probably say that they, we should do a fusion on this patient. And I don't think that's a bad option, but this, for, for this particular patient, we elected to actually go with a simple decompression. And the, the way I, I like to do these things is a two-base decompression. These two, by the way, were, were invented by that man back there, Dr. Foley. He actually invented this system so that it, it allows us to do what we're doing right now. So you intraoperative target the, the lamina there, and then you place your tube down specifically where that is. And this is now pointing right at the lateral recess. And this is what it looks like sort of on a saw bone. And if you take a look at um, what it looks on this oblique view, this is what it would look like. So this is what we call the tube down view. And then this is what it looks like on a saw bone. And then um, this is the kind of the surgeon's view because we're looking at it from the side. But with high-powered microscope, we can actually get really good detail of what we're looking at. So the first thing that you'll see is just a really fine layer of muscle. And, and the less muscle that you damage on your approach down there, the better it is for, for the paraspinal musculature. So when you sort of debris some of the muscle, you start seeing the lamina and some landmarks here. Then you, you take a burr and you burr that down. You kerosene that down and you, you end up with something that's starting to look like um, epidural fat. And so that's the L5 nerve root. So you, now you, you're convinced that the L5 traversing nerve root is no longer under pressure within the lateral recess. So let's talk a little bit about MIS instrumentation. This is a 65-year-old um, male, presents with worsening low back pain with left leg radiation, physical examination, some weakness in the great toe extensor, and sensory deficits in the left L4 and L5 distributions, and bilateral straight leg recess. And this is what his x-rays look like. And you can see over here, he's got a, a grade one isthmic spondylolisthesis. 
and it doesn't move that much. It moves about two or three millimeters at most, but this is, a, this is more unstable. And this guy actually has more back pain than the previous patient with kind of, you know, some stenosis in the lateral recess, not a lot of central stenosis. Um, there's evidence of bilateral lateral recess stenosis. And so the diagnosis here is a grade two L45 isthmic spondylolisthesis. And in this patient, I like to do, to do a, a fusion, a T-lift procedure. And um, Dr. Kwan's gonna talk about the T-lift procedure um, a little bit later on. But I'm, so I'm just gonna go through some, some of these operative steps very quickly. You know, four poster Jackson frame, scope, C-arm. You gotta make sure that it's positioned. Typically, I like to have the microscope on my side, C-arm on the opposite side. You want to always make sure that the end plates are parallel, both on the AP and lateral views. And this is what the oblique views look like. This is also very helpful if you want to confirm where your jam sheeting needle, um, as well as the guide wires, are located. But you also want to make sure that the end plates are parallel in this oblique view as well. So you make a, a stab incision with a jam sheeting needle down there. You can actually use the laser that's actually on the C-arm to sort of guide where that direction of that jam sheet may be going be going and then you put the guide wires in and you can sort of bring the guide wires down caudally so it kind of stays out of your way and then you, so this would be at the L5 level bilaterally and then you do the subsequent steps at L4. Step two is the decompression and so this is a little bit different this is unlike the laminotomy this is going to we're going to talk about the foraminotomy or the extra foraminal decompression and so this is a little bit different in the sense that where, how I position it down the tube view you should take a look at this which is the facet joint line, and then this, which is the parallel to the end plate or the disc space line. That's kind of the target that you want to take a look at. And you really want to make sure that the, the tube is parallel to the disc space itself because that's where you're going to do the majority of the work and the majority of the decompression. So this is what, what your tube down view should look. And underneath, this is on a sawbone what it, would, it should look like as well. Just that tip of that SAP. And in, in many of these patients with foraminal stenosis, it's that tip of the SAP that impinges into the foramen and, and into the exiting nerve root. And oftentimes when I do extra foraminal decompressions, I'll take that tip right off because that's the offending um, structure, anatomic structure that, that affects that foraminal stenosis. So this is kind of the surgeon's view of what it looks like. So in, in real life, though, this is what it looks like. You get down there and you see a, a very thin muscle. That's actually the multifidus. And unfortunately, you, you do have to kind of go through some of the multifidus. And when you start getting into this view, you can see something that looks a little bit more familiar. You have the L4 inferior articular process as well as the L5 superior articular process. You burr that down, just the tip of the SAP, and then you end up with this. And then I, I like to use like a curved foraminal kerosene to perform my foraminotomies. And you can see that this is the exiting L4 nerve root right there. And then, and then for a T-lift, and I, would, I probably wouldn't go too much beyond that for just a simple decompression, but for a T-lift, you want to extend that medially, especially if they have lateral recess and foraminal stenosis, or lateral recess and central stenosis on this, this ipsilateral side. So this is a superior articular facet now in that, that it represents the roof of the lateral recess. And you can take that down with a keras, and then you start seeing ligamentum flavum epidural fat, and then you can see the L45 disc space. So this is, a, this is the view that you really want in the, in, at Camden's triangle before you start doing a T-lift. So you can see um, up there, that's the dura or the traversing L5 nerve root. There's a exiting L4 nerve root here on your lower left, and the L45 disc. So for, for the, the fusion, you essentially make an annulotomy and I, th I love using this technique, especially in disc spaces. As you saw that one, it was completely collapsed, right? I love putting kind of this osteotome right into the disc space. And, and this is a different case, but I just wanted to just illustrate that you put the, the osteotome into the disc space, and you, you really want to just open it up. And even if it's completely collapsed, you can actually really unlock that, that fixed inner space. And then um, use a curette in order to do the the discectomy and the end plate preparation and whatever bone that you like to use or whatever biologic you like to use you know you can shove it down with a funnel and you can see that this is the t-lift cage you place that i like to place that an oblique cage sort of anteriorly and then pack it with bone both in front and behind and that's what the the cage looks like once it's actually seated 
And finally, um, facet fusion is another technique that you can use. And I, I think that this actually is a good technique to supplement um, your anterior column fusion. Here's a superior facet, inferior facet. You want to burr that down, create a trough, and, and really decorticate the, the dorsal elements and, and place bone in there. And finally, the pedicle screw instrumentation. Um, you, you, with the guide wires that you've already placed, you put, put in the screws, insert the rod, and the, with certain reduction maneuvers and types of instruments that they now have for MIS surgery, you can turn this, remember the previous grade two spondylolisthesis, and this is that case specifically, into something that looks relatively anatomic. So you really restore the sagittal balance, you restore the intervertebral disc space height, you restore the foraminal height by utilizing this, this technique. And you can directly visualize the rod passing through the, the pedicle screw itself. So this is another um, useful technique. A lot of people say, well, can you, what can you do with hardware that's already in there? You can actually take out hardware as long as there isn't any bone overlying the, the instrumentation. So essentially what you do is you, you, wanna, you wanna put it right along the, the axis of the disc. And you, again, you can use that laser from that C-arm. And then so you know where to make the incision, put a guide wire right on that screw, dilate over that screw, and then you could put the metrics tube right over the, the screw itself. And then you can actually see the screw then. So then all you really need to do is go in there and, and use the set screwdriver and then take the rod out. And this is a picture of the screw itself. And you just, you just take out the screw um, through that, that, that tube. And then this is, you know, this is an example of that pilot hole that was there from the screw itself. And so all you do is put like a blunt guide wire into that pilot hole. Finally, um, just talking about L5-S1 considerations, because L5-S1 is a little bit different, and these are some tips and tricks that I would recommend. Um, L5-S1, if you actually make it parallel, at every single level, I like to put the screws parallel to the superior end plate at every single level, regardless of it, whether it's spondylolisthesis, and especially for deformity, and I'll talk about that in my deformity talk later on. But if you do, do that technique at L5-S1, the difficulty is oftentimes those guide wires can cross, sometimes even before it gets up to the skin, which can be problematic, right? So what I like to do instead is I like to actually use a little bit more of a, of, of a caudal to cranial approach. So on the patient's right side, it would be at uh, five o'clock. On the patient's left, left um, pedicle in the sacrum, it would be at the patient's seven o'clock with respect to the starting point. And then you wanna aim it toward the center of the sacral promontory. And when you do that, then you have parallel um, screws and that'll also help you especially with like the reduction especially if you have like an L5-S1 um, spondylolisthesis having this parallel tra trajectory will allow you to get that reduction and so this is what the screws look like when you use this technique and I'll, I'll talk about a bicortical technique when I talk about the deformity talk so the post-op protocol for me this is just my personal um, what, what I tell my patients that I'm, I mobilize them immediately even for the long scoliosis case. Before it was like the patients would, you keep them bed bound for about a week or so, right? This is a long time ago. But now I, I get them up right away. I do put them into a soft LSO brace, not a TLSO or a clamshell brace or anything like that. Put them into an LSO that they can just strap on with a Velcro and they can cinch it tight. I, I allow them to do low impact aerobic activities at four to six weeks before then they could do all the walking that they want to do. And then at three months, I allow them to do higher impact aerobic activities like running, jumping, and sports. And then at between six to 12 months, if it looks like they're, they're healing appropriately, and if their CT scan shows that there's adequate fusion, I let them go back to doing whatever they want to do without any restriction whatsoever. So to end it, you just have to do it. That's, that's it, you know? There's no ifs, ands, or buts around it. Like, if you know, like before, I remember like, um, maybe even you know four or five years ago, we'd give these talks, and we really weren't sure about the results. Like we knew anecdotally, but the the, the evidence is coming out. I gave a talk on Wednesday about the evidence of of MIS. What's out there right now? It's clear now with respect to infection, you know, EBL or blood loss, with respect to postoperative pain, earlier return to function. Those are it's it's definitive now. We all know that. Like you can't deny that MIS is is not is not superior because it is superior to open surgery. So in knowing that, we really have to dedicate ourselves to doing the right thing and to, to, to do the hard thing. Thank you very much.